by it the should be live in. Is that the room you were in? Mm -hmm. All right, we should be live. All right, perfect. <laughs> um, welcome back. If you're here for part two of the healthcare sneak peek week, we just had a great conversation with Casey Ballard, who's a CRNA with Ohio Health. And now we're shifting gears and talking with two amazing surgical, surgical technologists from Ohio Health as well. Um, so with us today, we have Tony Fortunato and then also Sean Col Colbert as well. Um, and they, we are very grateful to have not just one surg surgical technologist, but we have two. So we're very excited. And they're actually working at the moment at, in, in their place of employment. So <laughs> we're very grateful to have them with us today. Um, so let's go ahead and, and just dive on in and just um, would you both be able to talk through kind of your current role and how you got there? Yeah, sure. Uh, I so I'm I'm actually um, a fairly new to this job. Um, I've only did, I've only been doing it for a couple months. I I did all of my uh, orientation or I did all my clinicals here uh, for school, and then so I started that like uh, earlier this year, and then uh, Grant hired me on um, as a scrub tech. So. Uh, as of right, as of right now, I'm in, I'm still an orientee, so I'm bouncing around different, um, specialties. So I've done, I've done general and plastics mostly so far as a, as a new hire here. Um, so, so right now I don't, I haven't done any cases on my own yet, but I'm do, uh, learning a lot. So I have, I have a, like a, a scrub tech that precepts me every day. Um, so I've learned a lot in general surgery and plas doing plastics right now, which I actually really like doing. So, so, I mean, but, but I mean, you pretty much do everything. You, you set up the room on your own. Um, you call for instruments. Uh, there's a lot of specialty things you need as far as dressings and, um, all those kind of things, especially in plastics are, are different in every case. Um, and then, yeah, you set the whole room up by yourself and obviously you, Obviously, maintaining a sterile field is 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 key for this job. So that's really important because um, even as an, an orientee, you know, you kind of get intimidated by surgeons sometimes. But you also have to, you know, they can they can break sterility a lot too. So you always have to be aware of of everyone in the sterile field and um, just make sure everything stays sterile. And then, yeah, during the case, you know, you're you're passing and um, making sure they have everything they need, making sure your counts are right keeping an eye um, on everything that needs to be counted. And then after the case, you know, well, and then you have to do dressings at the end and clean up and then turn the room over. So, so you're pretty, I mean, as an orientee, I'm pretty much doing everything. And uh, so far I'm really enjoying plastics. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And then Sean's got, he's got a lot more experience than I do. So he could probably tell you a lot more. Um, my journey is actually continuing from Ohio State. I was there for 10 years and um, I, I sort of got to a place for myself where I wasn't growing anymore and I needed to be perceptive of that. And I also felt like where I started wasn't where I wanted to finish. And there was only so much that I was gonna get exposed to in this field. And I don't know if it was the climate or COVID or whatever it was, it, it produced the perfect opportunity for me to start looking for another place to continue my journey as a search tech. And that's where I find myself here today. Um, I've, I've done the orientation thing at OSU. Now I'm doing it here at Grant. Um, I think orientation is basically going to be the same no matter where you go. But um, more or less, I think you should understand um, that you are going to have certain services that you like. And when you like something, you're probably going to be better at it versus services where, you know, they're probably they're your least favorite or maybe just, just your desire to see something might make it so that it's more enjoyable for you. But um, 
yeah, my journey here has been pretty cool. I've basically been sort of doing stuff on my own because of my experience, but that doesn't mean that I'm not in a place where I want to learn because I, I'm in a new environment with new people, and I'm sure that I can take away quite a few things from all these people that have been here. So you got to remember to stay open-minded and that one, one way that a hospital does something, um, another hospital can do it the same way, just differently. And neither one of them is right or wrong, right? So that's just where I'm at with, with where I am. But that's how I sort of got here. And, and I'm enjoying the process of relearning some things all over again, because um, being having the experience that I have, I sort of learned working the night shift at OSU, being a part of a skeleton crew. I learned that I learn a certain way. You know, your preceptor can lay out all the steps for you and this, that, and a third, but I learned through doing, I learned through repetition, and I learned through experience. And when I was learning how to do kidneys, when I first went to night shift, um, I felt like kidney transplant was like my Achilles heel. I wasn't good at it in orientation. I wasn't strong. I didn't feel confident. And so I put myself through that practice of, I want to do every single kidney transplant that comes through here. And when I got to a certain place where I felt comfortable, I realized like, that's how I learned it because repetition taught me good times and bad times stayed constant in my mind so that I would remember not to forget how much irrigation we used. Um, just, just little things. I would always mess up on the needles, for example. And I was like, okay, how do I, how do I proactively prevent this from happening since it's consistent? I'm consistently messing this up. <laughs> and so I learned that, you know, the way that I was doing it, when you're by yourself, you can adapt whatever way works for you better. And so instead of me doing it the way that people had shown me, I started burying my needles down into the little needle counter versus just sort of having them halfway hanging out, right? Just little things that you learn as you go along that help you to learn faster. So during this process of me being here for the second time, I'm taking a lot more information in that the first time I was in orientation, I kind of let like bypass me. Now I'm more of a sponge and I'm soaking up all the different little key elements that I know that I didn't learn the first time around from all the great people that I'm around. So that's me. That's amazing. And a lot of good, like very helpful tips in there too. Like definitely it sounds like being open to learn different things, um, wanting to challenge yourself. Like you mentioned, I'm very interested in like, what you all what all you guys do because I'm like what do you do with kidneys that's crazy <laughs> so that sounds really interesting um and then being it sounds like you know just being on the floor being able to adapt to different scenarios and I really liked the point too of kind of listening to just kind of listening to yourself and seeing where there's room to grow um if if the work environment's the right fit for you changing things up if needed as well um so that's really helpful um advice too um would you be able to walk through um, both of you be able to walk through uh just kind of what your typical day looks like in a role of a scrub tech yeah so um you know, you get you get here in the morning. Obviously, you put the first you put your scrubs on, and then you go up to the OR. And usually, the first thing I'll do is I'll go and look at the board, and that that tells you uh, that tells you each like what surgeries are in each room for the day, and when they're scheduled, and it and then it tells you uh, who the surgeon is, who the patients are. Um, it tells you um who's who's an anesthesia it tells you who's the nurse in that room it tells you and then it tells you who the scrub techs are in that room um and then it tells you whether they're inpatient or outpatient so that that way obviously obviously it tells you where you're going to be that day but it also kind of gives you a, just a, an idea for how the day is going to flow in general um then you usually usually you have a case right away um and you you'll go into your room and um you'll see the preference card and you'll start opening and I mean, it's, that's, that's when usually it's, usually it's just you and the nurse or you and anesthesia in there. Uh, you know, it's before the surgeon gets in there and the patient gets in there. Um, and you open, you open all your supplies and everything. 
Um, and then usually you'll scrub in and then set all of your things up. And then usually the, then they'll go get the patient, patient rolls in and then you're, you know, then the surgeon will come in and they, um, then they prep them and position them and everything. And then, and then the surgery starts and then that's, that's kind of how your day starts. Um, and then after the surgery, then you, then, like I said, before you, you turn the room over and then as soon as that's done, usually your next one is, is going to start in the next half hour or so. So it's just, you just flip the room over again, um, bring in your cart open everything. And then it kind of just repeats like that. A lot of times, sometimes cases cancel. Sometimes you have a little bit of time in between cases. That's just how they're scheduled sometimes. But a lot of days, especially in plastics that I'm doing now, you it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of turnover. A lot of times you have quick cases and it's kind of just like any other business where you're just, you're, you're flipping the room and you're starting a new and you're starting a new case. But a lot of things can happen. They, they can cancel, they can add stuff on. Um, so a lot of times it's just bang, bang, bang. And you're, and you're just, you're flipping and doing a case and then turning it over and starting a new one. So a lot of, a lot of times it's just the whole day, your whole day is, is just doing cases the whole day. But like I said, anything can happen. Cancellations, add-ons. Yeah. Um, my day starts off with a hot cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> because because I recognize the fact that one of my strong suits is I'm an early bird. And so when it comes to this job, I will use that to my benefit. So I start my day off early. I get up a little earlier than I should. I get to work a little early and I check my rooms out. Um, for me personally, the start of your day sets the course of your day. So the more I can see problems ahead of time before they come into the room and get them solved, the better day that I'm going to have, whether that means my surgeon is happy and the patient is happy, whatever it may be. But my emphasis is basically getting started and making sure that everything is where it should be. And another thing that I notice a lot of people um, tend to do sometimes or, or maybe neglect to do depending on the situation is if you have a question you should ask um, we're not supposed to be mind readers preferences preference cards are wrong cases change in the middle of the surgery it can change there can be an unforeseen event that happens open communication is very much a very strong principle to understand and utilize in this career field. Because um, in a, like you said, in a split second, the agenda could be, okay, we're gonna go ahead and close up. And then all of a sudden we're doing chest compressions. Open communication is, is I, can't, I can't stress that enough, is to, if you don't know, ask the question. And there's no wrong question. We learned that in, 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 in elementary, right? There's no wrong question to ask. That plays in this, in this career, in every scenario. If I have a question and I'm unsure, I go straight to the source. I ask my surgeon because he's the one doing the case and I introduce myself and I want him to know that you have someone that's in your room that's very attentive to whatever it needs to be done for this patient. And another thing that he might have said is that dealing with the personalities in the OR is one thing, but we are there for the patient. We are the patient's advocate because they are not able to speak for themselves in that situation. So it, it's probably not something that people really want to go into, but there are surgeons that want everything to be their way. And they don't care about the policies and they want to do it this way and they're going to do this and this is against the policy. And you have to be able to speak up. That doesn't mean that you get into an altercation or anything like that, but you let your voice be heard according to the responsibility that you have to that patient. After you do that, <laughs> you let it go. Because at that point, now you're engaging into a situation that's not going to be fruitful. It's not going to manifest anything positive. And you don't have to prove yourself to anyone. You're there for that patient, period. 
And so as long as you do your due diligence to speak up for that patient and do the best thing for that patient, you're doing your job to me. And that's all you really can do. Um, but yeah, he touched on most of the most of the factors, the fact that, you know, like right now, we had two cases that were plastics and now we're done probably until either emergency comes in or we're done until the rest of the day since we both leave. Are you leave at three? I leave at three, yeah. We leave at three. So from noon until three, we might not be doing anything. Right. So, but then again, from noon until three, we might be seeing a trauma or seeing a cranny or, you know what I mean? Like you have to be able to understand that your day isn't set until you clock out. And whatever demands is, that are put on you, you need to handle them professionally and with a good attitude. And most of the time, you're going to be appreciated because of that. And so that's how you start your day off. You start it off in a good way and you try to finish it in a good way. Everything in between can be a cluster. <laughs> but as long as your mindset is correct, as long as your attitude is right, you should probably be able to get through anything that happens. And if you're in doubt, ask the question. If you're concerned, voice your concerns. Um, this, this job is more or less about your ability to communicate and your attentiveness than it is about hard skills or soft skills. Because you're going to learn things on the job and you're going to bring certain attributes with you to the job. Yeah. But how you, how you optimize all those things is really on you and how you decide to delegate and, and respond to the stimulus that you're in. So I tell people, you know, what I do, and they're like, oh my God, like, how can you stomach seeing that stuff? Well, yeah, there is a, there is a degree of the ability to see blood and not be grossed out. There is the ability to see, you know, bones broken and spaghetti noodle arms hanging up. You know, there, there's all that stuff that I can tolerate. But this, the skills that I've learned is to communicate effectively, um, to voice my concerns, and to be attentive. Because we all know what it's like to be trying to talk to someone and you don't feel like you're being listened to. It's frustrating. And now you're in a situation where the surgeon is in a, in a very serious situation sometimes, and he just wants to be heard. And sometimes the kid is the kiddish personalities come out of these grown adults, but you have to bypass that and say, okay, I understand where you're coming from. So let me try to mitigate the situation so much that you can calm down. I can be at ease. You don't have to give me high blood pressure and the <laughs> nurse can chill out. You know what I mean? Because in my role as a surge tech, I understand very well my responsibility of how much stress I give to my nurse and how much attention I give my surgeon because he wants to know that he's being listened to. She needs to understand what I need. And I need to communicate with both of them because I'm in the middle, right? So you gotta almost, stop me because I'll start talking to no, you. <laughs> it almost sounds like a mediator, like a surge tech yeah. potentially is like a mediator yeah. between the you different are. personalities at times to help other people feel heard and make sure everything flows, you know, as it should. And so that's, that's really interesting. So um, that's a really interesting point. So you have to have some, some good like counseling skills, it sounds like too, yeah. and <laughs> helping people yeah. feel heard and comfortable um, in order to best serve the patient. So that's really interesting. Are there, um, what are some common kind of like clinical procedures or skill sets that you, that you often do in your, in your work? Um. Why don't you take that one first? Um, I think you're. I think you're more suited to answer that. Um, for me, working night shift for you know seven eight years at OSU, um, we saw everything. We saw everything. We saw failed suicide attempts. We saw um, a lot of self mutilation from prisoners. Um, we saw, you know, your classic emergencies, your ectopic pregnancies, you know, ladies, the lady comes in and she went to 
her doctor in her region and, and for whatever reason he doesn't feel comfortable providing the, the service or surgery for her so she gets transferred to us um you know trauma traumatic injuries everything from you know quarantine i call it quarantine stuff people that are bored they don't have nothing else to do those you know somebody hold my beer moments type thing to you know um, we were hanging out and then, you know, somebody got mad and I got in the way of a bullet. So it's a wide variety of, of, and a wide variety of just whatever comes in the door. And I think that was what I needed because a lot of times in this career field, you sort of, you get put in, in a, in a service where the hospital has the strongest need. That's what you can do for the hospital. But I have an expectation as the employee. And I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be the kind of person that doesn't feel comfortable going into an ankle fracture or a crane or a spinal fusion or a tonsillectomy or a DNC or a procurement or an organ tissue organ. Um, harvest. I don't want to be uncomfortable in those type of arenas. So for me, it made better sense to get the education being on a shift where I would be exposed to anything and everything. And for me, that's what I've seen. And, and that's, and it's, it, it's more of a compliment to yourself when you, you understand that you want more out of the scenario than what you're getting because that that just demonstrates that you know people might put your standard here you're only going to be right here because this is all we have a need for but when you put yourself in different places and different positions you can always climb higher than where they projected you to be but that's something that you have to want to do there's people that only want to do one thing Every day, that's fine with them. It's fine with me. It's fine with you. But when I'm in a call situation or if I get called in, I need to be able to perform optimally, just as proficient as I would in a service that I love to see, even if it's a service that I'm not particularly fond of. Because, number one, I am there for the patient. That patient doesn't need to know that I don't like this service. That patient doesn't need to understand that this is my second time seeing this. You know what I mean? They don't, they, they want to be better. And they want, they need the confidence that you can provide when they go to sleep that they're going to get the best care that they can, no matter what their ailment is, no matter if it's quarantine stuff or what, no matter what it is, they, everybody wants to be better when they have the opportunity. And so that's your job to me, in my opinion, that's my job to be proficient in all these different areas so that when I get called in, I'm, I am running at, at an optimal level of understanding and expectation. And it's okay to communicate, you know, Hey, I haven't, done this that many times because you're going to run into that scenario you're going to run into scenarios where you've never done something that's fine but your own assignment in this career is to educate proactively as much as you can so that things go better with you so that your anxiety level isn't through the roof yep. and you're driving your nurse crazy because you're scared She's scared for you. The surgeon's looking at you like, calm down, man. You, you have to take responsibility. And that's one way that I've learned how to take responsibility and, and minimize the amount of stress that I feel because my personality doesn't, I don't show stress that well. Meaning I could be really stressed out and you would never know. And that's good. That's, that's an applause to me because I never wanted to exude insecurity or or a lack of confidence. When I go into a room, it's like, I want the surgeon to be comfortable with me and understand that I'm proficient. And 
I want my nurse to feel comfortable with me because she's worked with me. Or even if she hasn't, I can say things to her to get her off the of edge. Because at the end of the day, we're all people in a high stress situation sometimes. And so, like you said earlier, it's a lot more about mediation than it is about, you know, what you know how to do, what you don't know how to do. Yeah. So that's just sort of what I what I've understand about a lot of the clinical situations that I've been in. You know, someone comes in and you're like, oh, my God, like what happened? You know, that's one aspect of it. But how do you deal with that moving forward with the care of this patient? You know, is, is very much an important trait as well. You know, so. Like, so it sounds like clinically you could see anything and everything. You can't oh, prepare yeah. for everything. Mm, it's good right. to try and challenge yourself to see as many types of different different things to help grow your confidence and put that patient first um, and gain that proficiency. So that's that's really crazy. So you so it's not necessarily like I'm going to see this all day. It could right. you never know with a trauma or something like that. So being it sounds like being adaptable and flexible and being able to maintain stress levels in high stress situations. It's very right. helpful in this career path for sure. Yeah, <laughs> um, you are going to be exposed to things that, that, that make you laugh. You're going to be exposed to things that you're like, Oh my God, you know? So yeah, those things are going to happen. And then the unfortunate side of things when, you know, when people pass away, those are always going to be sad you know, and, you know, you just, you just have to get used to the, the stark reality of being in healthcare mm -hmm. and how many different people respond to that stimulus very differently. And the best thing for you is to sort of find your common ground and, you know, be okay with it. And exposure is definitely a major thing, being able to, um, you know, get your feet wet in here to this situation and not be afraid. Because the one thing that I've learned is that when you show a, a willingness to learn attitude, people will teach you. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. They will open up to you about things that normally they might just be pondering to themselves as they're working on the spinal cord or working on the brain. But when you show an interest in what they're doing, they start to explain things to you that you wouldn't get from a textbook. Yeah, I totally agree with that because, uh, you know, I'm fairly new to this. So I ask questions all the time. Like today I was my doctor. I was, I mean, I asked him a bunch of questions and there are definitely times if there's something really intense going on, you, you know, you know, when not to, you know, when you should be quiet, but then, then there are times where you can read where it's, where it's going to be okay to ask questions. And I don't have a problem doing that. That's, I think that's like he was saying, it's not always about your soft skills or hard skills. It's about uh, being able to adapt and anticipate things and just and communicate is huge. So I feel like that's my strongest point. I think that's my, the, my best quality that I have uh, just naturally. Like I come from a bartending background. So I, so, you know, the personalities and, you know, the moods doesn't bother me too much. Um, but I, the things I struggle with the most are like organization and anticipation for sure. Like I'm always like, so, so I'm, I don't ever worry about my communication because that just comes naturally, but I always, I'm just not organized at all naturally. So I'm always, I'm always, when I'm setting up my, when I'm setting up my um, room or like my back table and my Mayo, I always, always try to visualize where I have every single instrument. So if they ask for it, I know where it is just because like I said, I'm not organized naturally. Um, <laughs> and then anticipation. So I'm always focused on that. I'm always thinking about that and I'm always trying to anticipate what's going to come next. Um, and I think you just have to, you just have to, you just have to work a lot of cases to, to, to have that come to you. Um, but I, I like certain days where I have where I'll have like the same kind of surgery over and over and over because then you kind of get you kind of get a, a um, you kind of remember how things are going to go and you kind of get the flow. But but yeah, I think I think what he said is really important. It's just it's communication is huge. Ask questions. Like he said, show, you know, show everyone that you're interested in what you're doing and, and yeah, and stay alert. I mean, you got to always try and anticipate what's going to come next. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's all really helpful. Lots of really helpful skills. And again, it's it's not I think it's so helpful to see it's not just, you know, you go to school, you learn these things. It sounds like it's yeah. a continuous learning thing oh, and being yeah. self-aware, too. Yeah, exactly. um, like saying, you know, I'm not I'm not that organized. So I really have to challenge myself to be organized and, and yeah. maintain that because it's part of the role. Um, yeah. So I think that's helpful as well um, for students to know, too. Um, Speaking of students too, what advice do you have for students um, resume building wise? So a lot of our students are, you know, potentially watching today might just be starting out. Like they might be doing their pre, pre-surgical tech classes, like, you know, and they're really want to get their foot in the door and build their resume. So they're a really great candidate for when they graduate. Um, what, what tips and advice do you have for helping them grow their resume? Um, and gain healthcare experience? I would, I would um, encourage them to find a place to volunteer mm. um, in, the, in the hospital field, whether it's, you know, just linen. <laughs> you know, that's what happened to me. Like I was just volunteering at a hospital and then I would uh, go down to the endoscopy department and just ask if I could help out. Um, you know, again, like just showing a, a desire to want to learn more than just where you are is going to always help. Um, obviously, you want to talk about on your resume, you know, the qualities that you've that you've accomplished and your accolades and stuff like that. But like they say, they're only going to read about 20. What? What? What is it? They read like 10 seconds, the first sentence of your resume. And yeah. if you don't say anything that catches their attention, they're chucking it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you really want to get under your belt some, some of the lingo from people that do this career and use that in your resume to show that you have some type of, you know, um, medical terminology background yeah. in your terms and you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta cake it up a little bit, especially when you're trying to get your foot in the door. But I mean, you know, man, that that's a good question because it's really, it's just really hard to sort of do that when you don't have the experience and you're trying to get your foot in the door. Cause that was one thing I ran into when I graduated from tech school, you know, every place that I put an application in, they were looking for a one year of experience or they wanted certification. Yeah. And I'm like, how am I gonna get experience? I don't have any experience, you know? <laughs> and so it really became a play on words the way I would write my resume out. You know, it was, I talked about my organization. I used a lot yeah. of medical terminology about, about how well I did things um, in my clinical experience. And definitely that also, when you're in your clinical experience, you know, be hungry. Yeah. Go after as much knowledge as you can and put that stuff down on your resume as, you know, don't lie, but get to a point to where when you're talking about something on your resume, if they ask you in an interview, you can break it down in detail. Yeah. So that the people understand that you have, you, you can, you can do this case or you feel more than comfortable doing this case, like alone you're right. type thing. So. And I think too, like find qualities that you have that you already have, you know, from from a previous job or or any other thing that you've done that relate to that are that relate to good qualities for being a scrub tech. Like, you know, for instance, with my bartending background, I put, you know, I put like I put that I would that I have like good organizational skills, which I don't I don't know how how true that completely is, but uh, <laughs> and I you know, and like I mean, I I managed a bar for a long time, so I think I think just I put that I that I would always have to diffuse situations um, with big personalities and, yeah, you know, person. yeah, I mean, yeah, I would put that I'm a good people person and um, just, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things and it's not any, any job that you've done, you can find good qualities that you have that will translate to. Um, so just, just experiences from your life, find characteristics that you're good at that, that will also translate to being good characteristics as a scrub tech. Also, I think, also, I think um, if, if you can join any kind of organization like like the AST 
Um, like I, like I was a member of AST, like the, I think any, like those kind of things always look good too. If you can join, you know, some kind of association that'll, that has to do with being a scrub tech. Absolutely. So, that, that's two other things that, that could, that could help you. That's perfect. Yeah, definitely. Like volunteer experience, joining professional yeah. organizations, making sure your resume has the keywords that they're looking for. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, being hungry and open in your clinicals and seeking different yeah. out. Plug for career services. If anyone needs help resume writing, come see us. We can help you with that too. Um, a question from the Facebook stream. Uh, one of the students is wondering, what kinds of questions were you asked in your interviews? Um, so I just, I guess I just had one fairly recently. So um, they, let's see, what do they ask? I mean, they asked me, they asked simple things like, why do you want to be a scrub tech? um what they'll they'll ask you like what do you think um why do you think you'll be a good fit here at grant um they ask things like why or you know they ask things like why did you want to become a scrub tech in the first place um pretty typical in interview questions um i can't think of a ton of other you know, ones that, are, that were that much different from it from any other typical interview I've had. I don't know if Sean can. My interview was not like that. <laughs> <laughs> my interview questions were um, oh my God. conflict resolution questions. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you deal with situations where you, you have to work with someone that you're not exactly favorable with? I had questions like, uh, give an example of how you resolved a conflict. Um, the, the most memorable question was, why did you leave OSU? Yeah. And why did you decide to come here with all your experience? Um, what are you expecting out of us as your employer, your new employer? Um, questions that... Fortunately, I already sort of thought about what I was going to say if they asked me. <laughs> um, but that, those are some of my questions. And and I think they're good questions that they asked me because at the end of the day, um, I think they sort of knew that I was, they couldn't ask me the same questions. With the experience that I had, they right. wanted to see what kind of employee they were getting versus you know, someone new who doesn't know a lot of the more basic things, they already established that I knew they were more or less like, okay, why did you leave and how can we keep you? Yeah. Uh, what is it going to take to make you happy type questions? Because it's not every day that people just want to leave, you know, a place that they've been for a long time. And so I think they recognize that immediately, like, you know, okay, so what made him start to question things right where he was for a, such a long time? So, yeah, I felt like my interview was, uh, <laughs> I feel like my interview went well because, you know, you're doing, you're, you're answering the questions really well when people start writing down your answers. You know what <laughs> I mean? I, I feel like I hit, I got my point across in a very uh, professional manner, even though I had to answer some questions that I basically didn't really want to go into but I wanted to make sure that I answered the question and I wanted them to understand with all certainty what my answer was to those questions. Like they asked me, um, um, cause one of, one of the examples was I said, the reason why I'm leaving is because of the management scenario. And I said, anytime that you mismanage anything, you run a risk of losing it. And they wanted an aberration on that. They were like, what do you mean? And so I gave examples behind that. So some of my, some of my interview questions were probably things that I probably didn't want to talk about. But since they opened the door and asked me, they gave me an opportunity to sort of go in detail along with my expectation moving forward of how I think would keep people wanting to call a place their workplace home versus, you know, I'm in orientation, I'm going to learn this and then I'm going to job hop because this ain't the right fit for me. You know, so I feel like this place is really good with trying to figure out what makes people want to stay here mm -hmm. versus having a big place with a big name that, in my opinion, doesn't really 
measure up to the hype, you know? So. Yeah, I think that's, that's helpful to hear too. And it's neat to see kind of the spectrum of the types of questions and thinking too about like, like the positive spin on certain interview questions. And like you said, having examples of things um, and being able to, if you're in kind of a frustrating situation, like being able to, to talk about it in terms of how you want to move forward and things like that to an employer. So that's great. And it, both yeah. interviews must have gone really well since you both got, yeah, <laughs> got this well, opportunity. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're um, just desperate, I don't know. Yeah, they're like, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I, 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 Confidently feel like you guys did amazing. Okay. Let's see too. And then another question came in and it is 1.30, but we can, um, I have two more questions if you have the time. Yeah, <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, the first question that came through is, have either of you considered becoming a surgical technologist first assistant? And if not, if you could explain what a first assistant is. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've thought about it. I'm not, I, I'm not there yet, obviously. Um, but uh, just with my experience, but I've definitely thought about it. Um, I think they said if you, somebody, I don't know if this is completely true, but someone told me if you have two years of experience as a, as a scrub tech, then you go to school for one more year and then you can be a first assist, which as far as I know, I, I am interested in it. I don't know if I'll do that in the future, but who knows? Um, but I think it just, I think you basically do the same thing, except you have more, um, there's more things that you're, that you're allowed to do as far as, uh, I think the main one that I can think of is suturing. I know you're allowed to, I know you can, you can suture as a first assist. Um, I've only worked with one or two first assists in a couple of cases, so I don't know exactly what it entails, but I've definitely thought about it for just for continued education. And obviously it's, um, it, it pays better as a first assist. So something definitely that I'll, I, I will probably be looking into in the future, but yeah, who knows? We'll see. Um, yeah, I'm interested in it also. Um, what first assisting really means is that, um, um, for lack of an explanation, you, you're a search tech that has the ability to put in catheters because a lot of places won't yeah. let you do that. Um, you can make the, the first incision or the entry into the skin for the case. And by the time the attending comes in or whether he's with you, um, you know, obviously you've already draped and all those things. They basically allow you to assist him in a more um, fundamental way for the procedure. For example, uh, last Friday I was doing a fusion and, you know, with my experience, I know what not to do and what to do. And I think the assistant in that case was probably new. And so she was um, having some issues with holding more than a few things in her hand at one time. And the best way to sort of first assist is to, like he said, always know where your stuff is. So you want to irrigate the spinal cord and you want to have a suction in your other hand to assist him because he's using the drill to burrow away the bone so that he can see, you know, the spinal cord and he's being cautious of the nerves. And then you use the irrigation in your left hand to sort of wash away some of that bone fragment, which clears the operative field. Right. And I started first assisting in that case because I saw that she was having difficulty. And, um, but, but those are just some of the examples of how you would do it. You obviously can close the skin. Um, when the procedure is done, you go ahead, the attending a lot of times will go ahead and break scrub and then you'll take the stitches and then you start closing and then you dress it. Um, so that's basically what first assisting is. And it's a more hands-on approach to what we do now, because like I said, there's a lot of things that we're not really allowed to do. When COVID first happened at OSU, they said, well, we're not gonna allow any students to be in the rooms with the attendings. 
And so now all of, all of a sudden we have a surge tech, a surgeon, a nurse, and an anesthesia only. Guess who needed help? The <laughs> surgeon. Because they're not used to not being with help. And so in that scenario, I had to first assist. And I'll be honest, <laughs> that gives you the greatest feeling. I, I understand now why some people want to be surgeons and go to school for 12 plus years. Because when you're moving the bowel and you got your whole hand inside of someone's abdomen or you're palpitating the heart or doing a cardiac massage or you see the lungs blow up with, with air and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's something that you can't, you can't describe that feeling. And I see now why a lot of surgeons do what they do because it's very hands-on, it's very rewarding, at times very challenging, but it's just, you know, the one thing I, I've, I've thought about is why did I choose this career? And it's because of the anatomy of the body. I mean, you can you can see it in little bitty things that you went through in life where you cut yourself and you heal up, or you might have a reaction to something. But when you're in this field and you see how, you know, infection can start from a little bitty dot and turn into necrophyte, necro, um, Necro, necrotizing fasciitis, or you see how cancer grows. Those are sad things that I've seen, but it's still anatomy and, and we're still working towards ways of sort of, you know, making cures and getting cures, but that's just a fascinating element in, in, in this world and of, of the career that we do, that we get a firsthand look at you know, your brain and your heart and your stomach and your intestine mm -hmm. and the peristalsis of your stomach. Whenever, you're, whenever your stomach growls, that's your intestine moving food down the track. And when you thump it, <laughs> it shrinks up. It's so cute. It's, <laughs> it's so weird. But yeah, that, that's what first assisting is. And, it, and, it, and it's a lot more um, involved and, and fun. Because a lot of times we're just sort of standing there holding instruments or we really can't see sometimes. Yeah. And when you're first assisting, you're like right there, right next to him or right across from him and you're doing it with him. And so I'm definitely going to be trying to, you know, add that to my resume <laughs> because I want to be able to do that. Because and, and it's also very interesting to learn from people that have years and years and years of experience in something that always has interest me. So, yeah. Really cool. That's, uh, I just learned a lot. That's really awesome. Um, that's mm -hmm. such a, there's, that's such a neat um, career path. And it's, it seems like there's a lot, lots of different places that you're able to go um, within this career path as well. Um, yeah. But I want to thank you both so much for Great. your time today and for sharing your insights and experiences with the students today. This has been a wonderful conversation and this has been a lot of a lot of fun. And like I said, I, I learned a lot. So I'm sure the students did <laughs> as well. Um, but we are so appreciative of your time today. And we'll let you get back to hopefully, hopefully it's a smooth rest of your day. And there's no traumas, no crazy okay. traumas coming in unless, yeah. unless you want one to pass the time. But <laughs> hopefully you guys have a good rest of your day. Yeah. But we are, again, so, so appreciative um, of your time today. Thank cool. you for inviting us. Yeah, man. thanks for having us. Awesome. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. And then um, tomorrow we're going to have here at noon on Facebook, um, our next healthcare uh, professional interview as well. So tune in tomorrow or no, sorry, tomorrow we're off Thursday and then Friday. Um, but yeah, have a good uh, day, you all. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks.